Right. Go ahead and make your way on in into the auditorium and or the overflow room. We want to welcome you here to Countryside to worship with us this morning. Uh, as you come in, please do make sure you grab a communion cup from the back table, whether you're in the overflow room or in the auditorium. Uh, my name is Travis Jacobs. I'm one of the young men preparing for ministry here at Countryside. And we want to welcome you here this morning to worship our Savior this morning. And as you come in, please do make sure you scrunch together in the rows. Uh, we're getting more and more full here on Sunday mornings, which is a blessing. And as you come in, just stand with us as we prepare to worship the Lord this morning. Psalm 147 one says this, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fit fitting. Let's praise the Lord this morning.
is at this moment that we are going to praise and glorify God as we celebrate the Lord's table together. So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, I'd like to ask you if you'd like to participate with us. You could be from a visiting church or from this church. We'd love to celebrate the Lord's table with you. However, if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ or if you are under church discipline, or if you have some form of unrepentant sin in your life, we kindly ask you to please refrain from participating in the Lord's table. Well, before we begin, I'd like to focus on a verse, 2 Corinthians 9.15, which says, Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. The inexpressible gift is the gift of salvation, of the Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. And our response should be, Thanks be to God. And so at this moment, we're going to have our time of prayer and reflection where we can ask God to check our hearts, see if there's any sins that we need to ask forgiveness for, that we need to repent of. And then after your prayer of confession, also offer up a prayer of thanksgiving, saying thank you, God, that we have the opportunity to do this at this moment. So let's have that time right now of quiet prayer and reflection. If you haven't already, you can go ahead and open your packages before we get started here. The reason why we come together to celebrate the Lord's table 
is to remember what Christ has done for us. He died on the cross for our sins. And as you have probably figured out from my opening, I want to focus on giving thanks this morning. You know, we should always be giving thanks because of the work of Jesus Christ, of how he saved us, how he died on the cross for our sins. And this is true during the good times, and it's true during the times of suffering. We should always be thankful for this. In fact, thankfulness is one of the best antidotes there is to suffering. No matter what's happening in your life, as a Christian, you should always be thankful for Christ, for the gospel. So I want to go through just some specific ways that Paul was thankful for the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. First, we should give thanks because of God's election. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you. God loved and chose us to be saved from eternity past. That's something that we should be grateful for. Uh, secondly, we should give thanks because we have God's word. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, and he's going to go on and explain, like when he was evangelizing them, they received the word from God. They had God's word. That's how they were able to receive the gospel. That's how they were able to receive salvation. Thirdly, we should give thanks because of God's grace. 1 Corinthians 1.4 says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. We don't deserve our salvation. This is something we should be grateful for, for God's grace. Fourthly, we should give thanks to God because of our victory in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15.57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ has conquered death and sin. Thank him for that. Fifthly, we should give thanks because of our freedom in Christ. Romans 6.17 says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you are committed. You know, thank God for our sanctification. He's growing us. We're no longer slaves to sin. We are free in Christ. And finally, we should give thanks to God because of our reward in Christ. Colossians 1.12 says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Uh, we should give thanks to the Father for our eternal reward, our eternal inheritance that we will have one day in heaven, only, only made possible because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. And we've seen so many parts of that gift this morning. We've seen God's election, his word, his grace, his victory, freedom, the inheritance. And there's so much more we just don't have time to cover. But there are many ways that we should be thankful for the gift of salvation that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why we celebrate communion, is to remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice on the cross for us. So as we are about to partake in the elements this morning, thank God for the gift of salvation and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'd like to ask one of our deacons, Bo Lynch, if you could go ahead and pray before we eat. Let's pray. Lord, as we humbly approach the table this morning, we are just so thankful for the gift, the ability to gather today and celebrate this, Lord, to be to, to realize that we have nothing to bring but dirty rags, and yet you still chose us. Lord, we're so thankful for the gift of your body. And as it was broken, Lord, we pray that we would not neglect that, Lord, and that we would continue to grow and love you through our body. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat. I'd like to ask another one of our deacons, Ron Craven, to go ahead and pray before we drink. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are eternal, you are sovereign, and um, in your great love and mercy, you 
provided a way through your son Jesus Christ and his spilt blood on the cross for our salvation. We just ask uh, that we would remember that this week and we are so thankful and grateful for what uh, Jesus did for us. So it's in his name we pray, amen. Jesus also said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often you drink in remembrance of me. Let's drink. Go ahead and stand as we continue to worship.
Let's uh, pray before we sit down, Lord. Thank you for being our everything. And we know that you are, whether we acknowledge it or not, you are our everything. And I pray you'd help us this morning to be a kind of people who recognize that and acknowledge that and seek to live for you and for you alone. Lord, we acknowledge that we often get in your way. We often claim to be our own gods and live as if we are our own gods, but I pray this morning you'd help us to focus on you as we've done so well, as you've shown us so well yourself through the songs we've sung and through the communion that we share together. I pray that as we open the word of God and hear uh, the message you have for us, that you would, you would help us to live the way you want us to live, be who you want us to be, acknowledge you as our everything, and I ask this in your name, amen. You can go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> Just letting people get, sit down and up. Who do you look like? Who do you look like? You know, some would say I look a little bit like my dad. Others would say I look a lot like my mom. We deal with babies a lot, don't we? Oh, he just looks just like his dad. And then the next person walks up, oh, he looks so much like his mom. See, outward appearances can, can change. They're different. Uh, I looked, when I was younger, I looked nothing like my brother. My brother, Chuck, who's 20 months older than I, looked nothing alike. In fact, um, the librarian once asked my mom, do they have the same dad? Um, true, true story. Um, but as we grow older, we look more and more alike, because he's getting fatter. <laughs> That's why. No. We look more and more alike. Well, in this section called the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus is calling his disciples to do is to live a life that looks like him, and not to look like themselves. And that's what we're going to continue talking about this morning as we open up another section of the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be looking in, in verses 38 to 42, which I titled, Showing Genuine Humility. And on your notes, add another word, an ampersand and the word dependence. Um, showing genuine humility and dependence. Because that's really, I think, what these five verses are about. It's being humble and dependable, or, uh, and dependent on the one that we ought to be humble before and dependent on. And not seeking our own way, not seeking our own rights, not seeking our own retaliation, but rather letting God do that and humbly depending on him. Three and a half years ago, I would have told you that I was a very dependent man. I was walking, I would told you that I was walking very closely with the Lord, and I depended on him for everything. And then one Wednesday morning, I woke up in October with a pain in my back that I thought would go away quickly. It didn't. And now three and a half years later, we're still into this journey of illness. This week, I had more tests that showed some more unexplained inflammation in my stomach. Don't know what's causing that. But what I quickly learned is that I cannot depend on myself. I cannot depend on doctors. I cannot depend on a diagnosis. I cannot depend on tests. I can't depend on medications. I can't depend on anything. It's interesting, about a year into the illness, I remember Kathy and I were sitting in our sitting room. She asked me, what have you learned? And I said some things I had learned, and she said, have you, have you thought about, have you thought about, um, this is why you need a good wife. If you're not married, go find one. Go find one. I'm telling you, well, if you're like 12, don't, okay. <laughs> but, you know, if you're, if you're of marrying age, you ought to be getting married. You ought to be actively seeking a wife. Because she asked me, have you ever thought that maybe before you got sick, you were very independent, and maybe God's teaching you dependence? I blew her off. I said, that can't be. It can't be. I've always depended on God. I'm sure I've always depended on God. And two and a half years later, actually it was about a year later than that, I recognized I wasn't dependent on God until I told her that day that I was probably not going to wake up from the nap. And, and I told her I loved her beyond anything else. 
and that I would see her in heaven because I was sure I was so feeling so awful. That's when I learned. That's when I learned to depend on God. And he's been taking me on that journey uh, ever since. And he still got me on the journey. Still has me on the journey. I still learn that lesson every day. Just when I think I got it, I get sick again or something else happens. But I, I've learned I cannot depend on anything or anyone but God himself. And today we come to a part of our text which teaches us not to respond to the things around us in self-reliance or with independence, but rather to respond with true humility and true dependence upon God who can make things right. Not only who can make things right, but who will make things right. After all, he's the only one that we can truly depend on. So far in this section, the larger section of the Sermon on the Mount that we're on, we've seen regarding the, the heart of the matter, the heart of the matter. That's why this sermon is part titled overall, The Heart of the Matter, Part 5. Because we started when Jesus started off with this, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. And what he's going after is not the letter of the law, but he's going after the heart of the one who would keep the law. And we've seen that regarding the following errors. We've seen it in resolve, regard to resolving anger. How do we deal with anger from the heart? Overcoming lust, avoiding divorce, and then walking in integrity or walking faithfully, not making vows. Today, we come to Jesus' teaching, I believe, on true humility and dependence. So stand with me as we read together these five verses. I'll read, you listen, or watch. You've heard it said, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone would sue you to take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile with, go with him, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You can sit down. So this morning we're going to look at two major points. Two major points. I know you think, wow, we might be done early, but don't wow yet, all right? Because in the second major point, there are four sub points. So that's a total of five or six things. So I only got 12 pages of notes. You're good. We're going to look at the letter of the law first, and then we'll look at the heart of the matter. So the letter of the law first. What was the letter of the law? The law was clear. The law of Moses was clear that, that if someone harmed another person, there should be equal consequences. This was given when Moses first gave the law in Exodus chapter 21, verses 23 and 24. This is part of the law. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. That's what Jesus is referring to. He's referring to or, or pointing back to that clear law, that clear legislation that says eye for eye, tooth for tooth. He's clearly looking back at that. Leviticus chapter 24, verses 19, 19 and 20, go further with this and say it again. If anyone injures his neighbor as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person, it shall be given to him. Seems clear. You poke out someone's eye, your eye gets taken out. You cut off someone's hand, your hand gets cut off. You take a life, your life is taken. Seems clear. That was the law to the first generation out of Egypt. What about the law to the second generation out of Egypt? Did Moses forget to say that? No, he did not. He said it to them as well. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 21 says, Your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So what Jesus is saying is a clear teaching of the law clear teaching of the law. And I think it's important that we recognize that these, these consequences were to be meted out judicially by the leaders of the city and by the priests of the city. 
in the day when the law was given and shortly after they got in the land, this was the responsibility of the city elders, the city leaders, and the priests of the city. These legal proceedings often took place at the gate of the city. You see a lot of official meetings taking place at the gate of the city. Um, it seems to be the place of judgment, and it's practical. It's very practical because of this reason. If, a, if an offender was found guilty, where were they to be taken care of? Outside of the city. So if you're at the gate of the city, you're not in the city, you find them guilty, you go cut off their hand right there outside the city. If they were to be stoned to death because of that provision of the law, you took them outside the city and you stoned them. So the city gate was a very practical place for that to take place. But these were, these were trials that happened at the gate of the city. If the leadership of the city determined that wrong had been done, then the leadership of the city meted out the punishment to the offending party. Often, the first person to throw a stone, the first person to make, was the offended was the offended, but it was only after a legal proceeding had taken place in which witnesses were called, in which it was made right. That was the law. That's how the law was prescribed. By the time we get to Jesus' day, things had kind of changed. This had morphed into a, a personal kind of retaliation, a personal kind of retribution, a, a vigilanteism, if you will, where you took what was right on your own personal level, leaving the leadership out of the process and thereby circumventing the law. So I want to be very clear. I think we need to be very clear that what Jesus is teaching is not to overthrow or subvert the law. He is not talking about forgetting legal proceedings. He's not talking about if someone kills somebody, then, oh well, let's forget it. I forgive you. You killed my friend. Or you killed me. I get over it. You cut off my hand. I forgive you. Let's shake on it. No, don't, don't do that. Um, he's, not trying, he's not trying to circumvent or overthrow the law. He's not saying that the legal prescriptions given in the law should be overthrown and undone. That is not what he's saying in any of these sections. But what he is, however, saying is that we as individuals should not personally retaliate against the offender. Nor should our attitude change toward that offender. It doesn't negate legal consequences but he negates an attitude that says, I must, I must fix this myself, or I will take vengeance. That's, a, that's an idea clearly taught through all of Scripture where God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. No, rather, our responsibility is to respond with humble dependence on God rather than ourselves. That's what he's calling us to. Every one of these responses is a call to hu uh, humble dependence on him, that God will get it right. I don't have to defend myself. I don't have to, to make, it, make it okay, but I can rather trust God that he will make it okay. So understand, the letter of the law was clear. The letter of the law was clear that when someone offended, there was a response to that offense. And, and so he's not saying sweep that under the rug. He's not saying forget that. He's not saying don't do any of that. What he is saying is a, a, our attitude should not be to defend ourselves, to make it right for ourselves, to not take justice for ourselves because we as individuals don't have that right. He, he actually, in this section, is rather going to help us live like and look like and walk like him but he's going to show us that his disciple, a disciple of his, which is what he's been talking about since the very beginning of Matthew chapter 5, he's been displaying what a disciple of his looks like, but a disciple of his responds differently when they're grieved, when they're aggrieved, I should say, aggrieved. When, something does, when someone does wrong to his disciple, they should respond differently. And he gives four examples or four areas of, of areas of response or areas of challenges to our humility. And I think every one of these is important. And I, and I think that 
each one of us has one or more of these areas that is a that is something that 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 you know we hold on to really tightly that we need to try to fix ourselves we need to hang on to and if 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 one of these speaks to you or more i really would like you to to let go to let go of that and to hear the teaching of god and to he, hear what jesus has to say to you and hear how jesus says you ought to live and who you ought to look like and who you should live like do we want to be disciples of Christ? I think the answer is yes for those who believe. If we do, then here's how we respond. Here's how we respond in four areas. And again, this is clearly in regard to personal retaliation, not to the, not to the criminal or judicial um, process that is done by a judicial system of law. He's not condoning the shrugging off of or the overlooking of criminal offenses. And he's not suggesting that we should do so. I don't believe that to be the case at all. I believe they should be dealt with appropriately. But rather, these are acts, especially the ones he gives, are acts against a person that challenge us in our humility in four specific areas. How, how do we respond when we're challenged in areas of our dignity? When our dignity is challenged, how do we respond? How do we respond when, when our security is challenged? When someone threatens to take our security away, how do we respond? Here's a big one. Here's a big one, probably one of the toughest ones that we'll deal with, is what about our personal liberty? When someone tries to take our liberty from us, how do we respond? That's a, that's, we've seen it, and you, you would know. And then our property. The last area is when someone, when our threat, when, when our property is threatened, what do we do? This, th there were areas of this passage that as I studied and prepared were, were really, really challenging. And I think because, I, I think this is a tough passage, especially for 21st century Americans because of the, the values we have, the way we live, and the way we've been brought up. We, we, we believe that our dignity is our right. We believe that our security is a right. We believe that our liberty is a right. We believe that our property is our right, and don't you touch it. So this is a real challenge, probably more so for us than it was for his listener. His listeners were slaves, or, 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 or at least ser uh, um, servants, um, they didn't have citizenship. They didn't have legal authority. They didn't have the right to, to appeal. They were, they, were, they were just a little better than servants and slaves. They didn't understand personal liberty the way they, what we did. And, and what we do. And we'll talk about some of those differences as we go. But I think, I think that if Jesus was teaching this message, preaching this message to 21st century Americans, he may have been stoned. He may have been stoned, and I, I don't want you to throw rocks at me, all right? I say that because it's hard. This is hard to listen to, but it's true. It's true, and I think we need to hear it. I know we need to hear it because that's where we're at right now in, in our study. So what do we do when our humility, our, our dignity is challenged? Jesus first deals with challenges to our dignity. A slap on the right cheek. Jesus says, you've heard it say, you, you've heard it uh, said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other also. Okay, um, I think that we need to recognize that a slap on the right cheek in, in Jesus' day was considered a challenge to your dignity. It was also, it, it had to have been a backhanded slap. If you're a right-handed person, which most people are, and you're slapping a person looking at you on the right cheek, you have to do it like this. I challenge you to try to do it like that. It doesn't work. But a right-handed person slapping someone on the right cheek, it has to be a backhanded slap. Just think of it. Try it right now. Slap the person next to you on the right cheek. What does that do to you? What did that do to you? It just instantly makes you angry. It instantly makes you angry. One of the best ways to make someone mad is to walk up and slap him on the face. Why is that? 
I mean, you know, you, you, you kick him in the shin. That's not hard. They don't get mad. They get angry. But, it, but you, you slap someone in the face, and it's just instant ire. Why? Why instant ire? Because I believe it's a challenge to your dignity. You, you're, you're, you're saying, when you slap someone in the right cheek, you're saying, in, in some senses, I am better than you. It's a clear assault on the dignity of the other person. Again, it, it nearly instantly rouses ire, not because of the pain, not because of the pain, but because of the affront and the attack on dignity. But we can learn much from Jesus' own attitude regarding this kind of an offense because it happened to him. It happened to him. And if you remember, but on the night of his trial, on the night of his unlawful trial, at the high priest at Caiaphas' house. He was there, he was being asked questions. Caiaphas was asking him a question. Caiaphas had to defend himself. Caiaphas shouldn't be proceeding over an unlawful, illegal trial, but here he was. And Caiaphas asked him a question, and Jesus responds by telling the truth. By telling the truth. And as he tells the truth, someone near him pops him on the face and says, how dare you talk to the high priest that way? What's he doing? He's challenging Jesus' dignity. He's saying, you're scum. That's the high priest. How dare you talk to him that way? What did Jesus do? Understand what Jesus could have done. Jesus could have said, don't you ever touch me like that again. Remember what he did to a fig tree for not giving him a fig? <laughs> he did, right? <laughs> well, he could have done that to the guy who hit him in the face. But what does he do? He simply says, I'm sorry. I didn't know that was a high priest. I shouldn't have talked to him that way. I shouldn't have talked to him. He didn't, he didn't fight for his own dignity. He didn't claim his own dignity, but rather Peter, Peter says he, he responded this way. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 23, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued, here's the important part, Here's the important part. He continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. You see, Jesus recognized that it wasn't his responsibility. It was not his responsibility to, to make things right for himself. But rather, it was his responsibility to let the one who judges rightly make things right. He recognized, he recognized his proper position under the one who had all authority. And that's what he calls his listener to. That's what he calls the one who he's teaching to, is to recognize that, that we aren't the ones that need to defend our own dignity, but rather God will defend our dignity. He calls us to follow the example of, his, of Jesus himself who suffered silently. Suffered silently. I mean, think about what he went through. Think about the way he suffered. Think about the way he died. Think about, think about the, the many times he was slapped, the way he was mocked, the way he was made fun of. His dignity became nothing. He was given a, a, a staff. He had crown of thorns popped on his head and he had a purple robe padded into the wounds so that they would stick to the, to the and sca start scabbing over. And he had Roman soldiers who were nothing but pagans mock him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews. His dignity was challenged, and how did he respond? His ultimate response was, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they do. His response was to continue entrusting himself to the one who judges rightly. You know what? I bet you don't do all the time. I bet you don't judge rightly all the time, but I know there's one who does. There's one, there's one who does. And when we are slapped on the cheek... When our dignity is challenged, our response should be to respond the same way Jesus da, da, did and continue entrusting ourselves to the one who judges justly. He'll take care of it. He'll take care of it. I think our response rightly should be rely, reliance upon God. It's a humble dependence on God. And it's not a, it's not a prayer, okay, God, get him. Get him good. That's not humble de de dependence. It's God will take care of this. I don't have to fight for myself. I have to fight for myself. That's what he calls us to. That's what he calls us listener to when, when our dignity is challenged. That's a hard one. 
That's a hard one. You know why that's hard? It's hard because I want to be right. I want to be right. I want, to, I want to be better than the other guy. I want to show that I know better than the other guy. This is why a lot of, 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 of arguments happen in homes, because I want to be right. I want to be better than you. You're challenging my authority. You're challenging my dignity. Why not be righteous? That's one of Kathy's. I stole it from her. Would you rather be right or would you rather be righteous? Jesus calls us to righteousness, not to rightness. How do you respond when your dignity is challenged. Here's a question. I know we don't like um, masks, okay? But how do you respond when you walk to someone and they say, I'd really like you to put a mask on? They slap you on the cheek and tell you to do that, challenging your dignity. What do you say? What do you do? Jesus would say, I'll put two on in order to uh, protect you, whatever, because you're a person just like me, I'll put two masks on. Because he doesn't just say, don't respond in in anger. He says, turn the other cheek. Give him that one too. So you got hit on that one, give him that one. You know what that response does? I've tried it. I've tried it. I didn't know I was trying this, but you know, when I was younger, I remember a time when my brother, again, sorry Chuck, was really upset with me, um, and uh, he, he slapped me, and I knew, I, I knew he could take me in a fair fight. I absolutely knew he could. He was older than me. He was bigger than me. So my response was, oh, you hit me? You think you hit this one too? You know what he did? Melted. He melted. And he acted like he was sorry. I don't think he really was, but he acted like he was sorry for hitting me. <coughs> Let's be righteous. Let's respond correctly when our dignity is challenged. He moves on from dignity, though. He doesn't just stay there. Now he moves to a challenge to our security. He wants us to respond in humility and humble dependence when our security is challenged. He goes on to say this, If anyone would sue you to take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. This is a very interesting interesting concept in, in their day. Because, because in their day, most people only had one set of clothing. They didn't have multiple clothes like we have. They didn't have closets full of tunics and cloaks. Typically, they had maybe one or two tunics and usually one cloak. And that cloak was really important. The cloak would serve as their blanket. Let me tell you what a tunic was. A tunic was like a, um, a, a shirt worn under the outer garment. Um, so you might say like a t-shirt or um, a, a slip, that kind of thing. It wasn't, it wasn't the outer garment. It was a, something worn under the outer garment. That was the tunic. The cloak was the thing that was on the outer outside, and the cloak was a very special garment. The cloak was um, even a thing that even in the law of Moses was highly valued. Moses says to the people, that if, if they took a cloak as a pledge, they had to return that cloak to its owner before nightfall. They had to do that because that was the guy's blanket. That was what the guy had to, who, uh, to, 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 to um, feel secure at night. And so, so what Jesus is doing is radical in his day because he's saying if someone sues you for your undergarment, give him your outer garment too. He's not saying, go home in your loincloth. I don't think he's saying that at all. I think what he is saying is is showing the the, the extent of how we are supposed to trust God for our security. Now, this is, the backdrop is a legal proceeding in which someone is being sued for their tunic. This isn't just somebody who comes up and asks you, hey, can I have your tunic? But rather, there's, there's some kind of legal proceeding going on in which you are responsible the idea is you're going to lose your tunic. They're, you know, they're taking the shirt off your back. Um, and he says to that, if that's the case, if you've wronged the other guy, then make it more than right. Make it more than right. Even if that's a challenge to your security, if you've wronged the other person, make it more than right. 
Jesus calls his disciple to go beyond what is being requested and to make things more than right, even when that threatens our own personal security, even when that threatens our, our, our warm, warm sleep at night, even when it threatens the thing we hold, hold dear. Like Linus's security blanket was the cloak of the day, do, and so it would be like Lucy saying, Linus, I need your shirt and your, and your blanket. Linus would never give it up. We're called to give ours up. Paul actually somewhat addresses this in court proceedings against another in 1 Corinthians 6, and he calls the body of Christ to avoid these kinds of proceedings. And he actually reaches the following conclusion in 1 Corinthians 6, 7. He says, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Why not stop the process in the first place? and go repay more than you owe. Why not go stop the process in the first place and admit you're wrong and make it more than right? That's what Paul calls us to. I believe that's what Jesus is calling his listener to. How much do we value our personal security? How much do we value our personal security? Are you willing to go beyond making it right and making it more than right? That's Jesus' call. Let's move on. And here's the sticky one. The third area that Jesus challenges is our personal liberty. Personal liberty. This is hard. This is hard because especially we in America, we value, we value liberty. Liberty matters. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? Isn't that, isn't that guaranteed in our Constitution? And as we should value, um, we should not value our own dignity and our security more than we value being right with the Lord, so we ought to not value that liberty more than being right with the Lord. And th this challenges us. This challenged me. This challenged me. Roman law, Roman law, under the, uh, the, the thing called the Pax Romana, uh, there was a, a period of Roman peace that Augustus started. It lasted a long, long time. I didn't steal that from Jeff, by the way. Uh, it lasted a long, long time. There was, there, was no, um, there was no war taking place. There was no war taking place. It was called the Roman peace. No war. And in that time, when there was no war going on, Roman law allowed a Roman soldier to impress a non-citizen to carry his luggage for a Roman mile. He could walk up to anybody at any time and say, I need you, you are carrying my luggage for one Roman mile. Now, a Roman mile is a little bit shorter than our mile today, but that's how far it was supposed to be. And this was a clear challenge to personal liberty because it didn't matter what you were doing, didn't matter what time of day it was, didn't matter, matter what you were in the middle of, didn't matter any of that. You had, if you had plans for the day or not, it was done. When the Roman soldier impressed you to take his luggage, he, you had to do it. If the soldier said, carry my bag, guess what you did? You carried his bag. And this is something that the Jews didn't like at all. They didn't like it at all. It, it, it irked them to do this. All those, and, and let me say, all those who lived in Israel that were born in Israel were not Roman citizens. So every one of them, Every one of them that Jesus is talking to, everyone in that audience could have been one that would have been compelled to carry a bag. And they didn't want to do it. And Jesus radically confronts this issue by not just saying, go the one Roman mile, but he says, go beyond the first mile and offer a second, offer a second mile. You know, we have the saying today, go the second mile. That's directly from this teaching in Matthew chapter 5. The carrying, I think, of the bag would be a clear reminder of the carrier of the bag of the Roman oppression. Would have been a clear reminder because had it not been for the oppression of Rome, there would have been no need to carry the bag. 
Had it been not for the oppression of Rome, then you could have done what it was you were going to do. You could have been with your family. You could have gone to the softball game. You could have done whatever it was you were supposed to do at the picnic. Whatever it was you were going to do, you could have gone and done that. But you couldn't anymore because now you were, you were impressed to carry the bag. Clearly, clearly a, a, a reminder of the political oppression. And again, everyone in Israel lived under that. And so it was a reminder that everyone who lived in Israel had no real personal freedom, had no real personal liberty. And it was hard for them to carry the bag. And so Jesus calls them to go beyond the normal response of grudgingly carrying the bag to graciously offering an extra mile. Going beyond grudgingly carrying the bag to graciously offering an extra mile. This is radical. This is radical. But I think, I think his disciples understood what he's calling them to because of their response under oppression. In Acts chapter 5, we won't go there, but you can, you can think about it. In Acts chapter 5, there is a, a time when the apostles were thrown in prison because they were teaching Christ. And there was a long conversation about the leadership who had been trying to oppress the teaching of Jesus. What do we do with these guys? What do we do with these people who are proclaiming Jesus to the nation? Well, eventually, the disciples were beaten and released. And today, their response would be to file a lawsuit for unlawful imprisonment. Today, their response would go to the ACLJ and have um, Jay Sekulow file a, file a claim for them, right? Or Jay Sekulow's kid, whatever his name is. That would be the response today. Today, there would be some kind of Brian's Law sent to Congress to avoid personal oppression. That's what would happen today if the same thing had happened. What did they do? What did they do? I think they did something that was la radically different than what I would do. They left rejoicing. They left rejoicing. Why were they rejoicing? Look at Acts chapter 5, verse 41. I'm making this up. They left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They, counted, they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They rejoiced at that challenge to their liberty, that challenge to their liberty. Here's a tough question. Here's a tough question. Are we willing, are we willing to give up personal liberty and rejoice at being called to suffer dishonor for his name? Are we, I think we've been tested in that. I think we've been tested that. It, understand, I understand the whole idea of when we're called to do something that goes against God's word, we should do the thing that goes, we should do it anyway. I get that. But when it's a, an affront to personal liberty that has nothing to do with whether or not we can worship or not, with nothing to do with whether or not we can proclaim Jesus or not, when it has to do with, I won't go, I, I, I told myself I'm not going to do it. You go there. You know where I'm going. You know what the hot button topics, hot button topics are. Did I say that right? Did that come out right? Hot button topics? I think I said it like that. Hot button topics are. You know what they are. When you're, when you're pressed in those areas, which is more important to you, your personal liberty or living like Christ? Again, I am not talking. I am not talking about when we're called to do something that is against God, that clearly we stand for God every time. I'm talking about when your personal liberty is attacked. What's more important to you? What's more important to you? Being free to do it or responding like Christ? Jesus calls his follower to give up their liberty. To give up their liberty. Because they could have walked one mile and turned around and walked home. But he says, go another mile. Go another mile. radically different than I think how we live and it's hard because we live in America where freedom freedom is valued highly this this was a hard one for me but it wasn't the hardest I'll tell you it wasn't the hardest one for me what's next was the hardest because now Jesus finally moves to the challenge of our property 
John the Party, he says this, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. How, how tightly do we hold to what's ours? I, I think here is a clear call to hold loosely the things that we claim to be ours. He calls his follower to give generously with no strings attached. He calls his follower to, to lend freely with no expectation of return. This is hard because... In the, in, the, in the challenge to our property, there's a challenge to our security, there's a challenge to our liberty, and there's a challenge to our dignity. Because that's our stuff. That's our stuff. And, and I worked hard to get that stuff. Who gave us the stuff in the first place? Where did you get your stuff? And if you think it's because you worked hard, you got a wrong answer. It's God who gives you your stuff. It's God who gives you all of your possessions. It's God who gives you your property. It is God's provision. He has the right to give it, and he has the right to ask for you to give it as well. This is not a sermon to talk about giving to the church. I'm not even talking about that. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about someone who needs help. Someone who is destitute in Jesus' day, in Jesus' day, beggars were those who were blind, who were lame, who were cast away. There was no welfare system. There was no help. There was no, there was no um, way to get assistance. If you needed assistance, the way you did it was you sat on the side of the road and you begged for it. And you counted on the generosity of others. You counted on the generosity of others. You see, you see begging going on all over, all over. The, the, the time of Jesus' day. And, and so what Jesus is saying is if you have some cash when you go past the beggar who really needs it, give him some money. Hold loosely the thing you have. Give to the one who begs from you. Yeah, but, wait a second. This is for me. This is, this is big for me. There's no yeah, but there. There's no yeah, but. I understand it was very clear in that day who needed handouts, who needed help. Maybe a little foggier today who really needs help. But I would suggest there are ways to give. There are ways to be generous that don't include money, that don't include money. Here's the thought. Here's the thought. I'm just trying to be practical. Just trying to be practical, all right? You ever go out to dinner and have leftovers? You ever do that? Here's a thought. Take those leftovers in a to-go box. And, and when you see someone by the side of the road, give them that. What's going to happen anyway? They're going to be thrown away. Right? Okay, so um, just hold loosely things. Hold loosely things. If, if you give, don't expect it back. If you lend, don't expect it back. I have that philosophy a lot. If I, if I lend something, I expect never to see it again. If I, do see it, if I do see it again, I expect it to be completely broken and unusable. I'm never disappointed that way. I'm never disappointed that way. We're supposed to hold loosely those things. Paul, Paul actually had learned this lesson. And we use, we use Philippians 4.13 for a myriad of things that aren't what Paul's talking about. I can climb the mountain because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But that's not what he's talking about. Can we? Maybe. I would never climb a mountain. That makes no sense. <laughs> but Paul is talking to Philippians, writing to Philippians, and he, he is thanking them for a gift that he has received out of the generosity of their hearts because they gave out of their desperate, needy condition they gave to him. And he says this to them, I'm not speaking of being in need. If I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content... I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let me ask you a question. This is a hard one. Think about it honestly, though. Are there areas, are there things of yours that are off limits to God? 
Is there something that if someone were to ask you to borrow, you would say, ooh. If someone wants to drive your car, can I drive you anyway? How tightly do you hold that property? How tightly do you hold that property? See, God's call, God's call to us is to hold things loosely. Hold things loosely. To the one who gives, to the one who begs from you, and the one who borrow lend freely. That's, that's clear. That's clear. So we're to respond in humble dependence when our dignity is challenged, when our security is challenged, when our liberty is challenged, when our property is challenged. That's what Jesus is calling his reader to do. If we live like Jesus, if we look like Jesus, I believe we'll be called to surrender all of that for the glory of God. And he's not talking as someone who never did it. He's talking as someone who had already done it. If you don't believe that, then read or consider Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Philippians 2, 5 through 8, where Jesus empties himself, becomes human, becomes a servant, gives himself up to die, not just death, but death on the cross. He had done it. The living, walking Jesus had already done it, and he'd done everything he was calling his reader to do. We need to live like Christ. We need to live like Christ. This is not just a call to be in awe of Jesus' sacrifice, but a call to live the way he lived, to walk in humble dependence and to trust God completely in every area of our life, in every area of our life. As, as I studied this week, I came across this quote of George Mueller that I believe really is important. It really directs, directly it comes to our, our topic today. I think it's going to go up. George Mueller said this, and he was the guy who had the orphanages that would pray for food and food would show up. He says this, there was a day when I died, utterly died to George Mueller and his opinions, his preferences, his tastes, and his will. I died to the world, to its approval and to its censure. I died to the approval or blame of even my brethren and friends. And since that, I have studied only to show myself approved unto God. It, uh, I had to ask myself, is that how I live? Is that how you live? Is that how we live? W will you live in a way that you've died to self and are living only for the glory of God and willing to give all? and go all in for Christ. Now, I know if you're a believer, an unbeliever here, and you're hearing what I'm saying, I'm sure this sounds like absolute craziness to you, as it should, as it should, because you're not a follower of Christ. But if, if you will surrender to the call of Christ, respond to the gospel, I'll promise you God will transform you into the image of his son and you can live like this and you can not just live like this, you can rejoice to live like this. But you're called to respond in repentance and faith to the call of the Spirit. If you are here and would like to or need to talk to me or to one of the pastors, please feel free to do so. Uh, we'd love to show you the way to become a humble and dependent follower on Christ. For those, those of us who believe, those of us who are here and claim Christ, I, I urge us, I beg us, I, I challenge us this week to look like Jesus. Look like Jesus. Live like Jesus. Walk in humble dependence as he calls us to walk. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the time this morning. Thank you for the truth of your word for the blessings we find there, for the challenges we find there, even for the hard things we find there, the hard calls to live and walk. I pray you would give us strength to do so. I pray you'd give us courage to do so. I pray you'd give us humility to do so, that we might live and walk like you and look like you in the middle of a wicked and perverse generation. And I ask this in your name, amen. All right, you can go ahead and stand again and we'll sing a song.
Would you sing this with me as a prayer to the Lord? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them Take my hands and let them prove happy. you that we are continuing our series through the book of James tonight, so if you would like to hear from the book of James, uh, come back this evening at six o'clock. I'd like to close with these words from the Apostle Paul. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.